This is the Horse Radio Network. This is episode 59 of Horsemanship Radio, brought to you by Index Fund Advisors, IFA.com. Horsemanship Radio is a part of the family of the Horse Radio Network. And today we have a treat. We have three men and a horse on the radio. <laughs> This is Debbie Laux, and you're listening to the Horsemanship Radio. Thank you for joining us. Horsemanship Radio airs on the 1st and the 15th of the month, and I have my producer, Jen, with me today. Hi, Jen. Hello. I love how the show notes now have um, under who is producing the show. It just yeah. has E-N-N. N. So you Could can be put Jen. whichever one you need. Could be Glenn. <laughs> Could be Jen. <laughs> and you guys are perfect. You're perfect. The perfect couple. There we go. I never know until you Skype me, which is really fun to have you on. And I knew, you know, I, I had a suspicion that when I said that we were going to have Ben Masters, star of Unbranded, on, and Nick Roldan, the leading American polo player, on, that maybe Jen would show up instead well, of Glenn. You know, on so many levels. First, we have um, model, quality, gorgeous polo player. Yes, we and we do. have super adorable cowboy Ben Masters. That's one level. So cute. Yeah. Right. And mm-hmm. then we have amazing horseman polo player. Yes. And amazing horseman cowboy. Mm-hmm. And then we have people who genuinely are influencing the perception of horses around the world yes. polo player. Yes. And someone who is changing the perception of horses around the world. Ben, Mm -hmm. how can I not be here for this? I am so glad you are. I know. I love that too. Yeah. The reluctant leaders a little bit. Now, Nick, the polo player is not as reluctant. I mean, I think he gets it. He really, I mean, he is now a global ambassador for the Brooke Animal Welfare Organization, which is now just expanded in the U.S. And he has, I mean, he's multi-generation polo player. So he gets that world travel, that global view of the world. I think he's one on five continents and, uh, and really gets it. But I don't think he set out to be an influencer. I think he just loves polo and he loves the horses, which is, you know, my, my heart. Right. And then Ben may be more the reluctant influencer, as you say, because uh, I think he set out to do a post-college flyer, you know, fun with the boys. I don't want to get married yet. You know, let's do something really fun. Yet digging into it, he really saw a cause behind it, which is pretty darn cool. Yes. What started out as a post-college guy's final fling before they have to get serious and grow up, you know, (laughs) it it was their version of going to Europe and hitchhiking across Europe. With backpacks. Yeah. It's, it's road trip, but it's, Road apples. Trip, yes, road apples. Trip. Yeah, and there's road <laughs> apples. It's so yeah, both literally and figuratively. For those mm-hmm. who have not seen Unbranded yet, that no, is interesting don't. because Ben, as an influencer, an influencer being someone who um, others listen to and take advice from, whether consciously or subconsciously, perhaps didn't start out as an influencer, but had realized early on in that process that he was going to become one, and then really embraced it uh, wholeheartedly and mm-hmm. the resulting film unbranded is uh is really getting people talking and getting people thinking it's so fun to look at posts thanks to online mm-hmm. social media mm-hmm. how it's gotten people thinking it's not all gold stars and sparkles as i like to say the mm-hmm. people who talk about unbranded it's fantastic documentary but mm-hmm. it's not all gold stars and sparkles and it's it's so cool to lot, watch people talk about that and digest it and how they're taking it in and then applying it to their world. Oh, yeah. I, I think there could be college courses taught on this thing with leadership, you know, the leadership yes. qualities, the things yes. they had to do to do Kickstarter campaign, I think they did. And, and um, oh, just, you know, you, you got to isolate on the donkey and the leadership uh, lessons mm-hmm. that donkey, oh, donkey yeah, teaches horses. us. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. The different horses and donkey in this case, the different horses are literally characters within the story and they all have different character traits that make them good at what they're doing or perhaps not so good at what they're doing. And, mm-hmm. and recognizing that the human having to recognize that and say, we need to put that personality in a different place. 
so that they mm-hmm. can thrive. You're right. I never thought of that. <gasps> Ooh, oh, another yeah. reason to watch it again. <laughs> See? Exactly. I mean, you, there's layers here. There's layers here. Yeah. And it's fun because we brought dad in. We brought Monty Roberts in to, to really usher this through in both cases, both with Nick and Ben. And, uh, you know, he watched the unbranded and he saw the layers in there too. And I think the fun part is that everybody will have their own take on there's some things that are strongly opinionated, but not political. It's just, it's really pretty apolitical. It's pretty yeah. balanced. Yeah. But I think you'll pick those things that you think, oh, that just drove me crazy or that was just so inspiring. And, and um, you know, I mean, it must be amazing for somebody like Ben to see uh, people from New Zealand are seeing this film and opining and people from <clears throat> Europe and just, you know, the four corners of the world. And here's this young man in Texas, you know, um, just kind of taking it all in. And, and we, we can't wait to see what he's going to do next. I know it's going to be a fascinating conversation. And then Nick is kind of the opposite end of the spectrum. He is someone who um, grew up around horses. Mm-hmm. He went into polo as a professional player, obviously very seriously. You don't become a professional polo player unless you're pretty darn serious about your sport. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah. So yeah. his, his uh, initiation into becoming an influencer was very different. Yeah. And yet here he is – a few years later as a world-class polo player and discovering his role as yeah. someone who can improve the lot in life for the, for humans and the equids that they work with by working yes. with uh, the brook. So it's going to be great stuff. Good stuff. Let's get into it. Hi, I'm Mark Hebner, president of Index Fund Advisors and proud owner of Monty Roberts Willing Partners graduate, He's a Sugar Bear. <laughs> You know, investment portfolios are a lot like horses. You need to find one that best suits you, your temperament, and your stage of life. Some people might like an energetic horse and an aggressive investment portfolio, while others are more comfortable with a gentle ride and a more conservative investment portfolio. The trick is to find the one that's right for you. That's what Index Fund Advisors is all about, matching people with portfolios, risk-appropriate, low-cost, and globally diversified investment portfolios. You can find the right portfolio for you by taking the Risk Capacity Survey at ifa.com. That's IFA as an index fund advisors. Or you can call us toll-free at 888-643-3133. That's 888-643-3133. Ben Masters is the mastermind of the movie Unbranded. In 2010, he and two friends completed a 2,000-mile ride along the Continental Divide. They were broke at the time and adopted a few $125 Mustangs from the Bureau of Land Management to supplement their string of quarter horses. They were surprised to find that the Mustangs outperformed the domesticated horses. Intrigued, Ben Masters looked into the wild horse controversy and found a sad and complex situation, 50,000 unwanted wild horses in burrows living in government leased pens and pastures and in need of permanent homes. He decided to do something about it. The unbranded idea was born. Well, welcome. We've got Ben Masters and Monty Roberts on the line together. I'm so excited. Ben, where are you calling from? Uh, I'm in Austin, Texas today. Austin, Texas, and Monty, I think you're home. I'm home in Solvang, California. Nice to hear your voices. It is so fun to get both of you on the line. Um, it, it's been a couple of months, I know, in the making. You have busy schedules. Ben Masters, as we've uh, introduced you, is uh, from the movie Unbranded, the documentary movie. And Monty Roberts is a, a world-renowned clinician, as you know. So for new listeners, we're really excited to put these two together because their common ground is wild mustangs. And what woman doesn't want to hear about wild mustangs from two men? I think that sounds <laughs> awesome. <laughs> So, so I, you know, I'm, I'm just flabbergasted that you were able to put this together, Ben, and, and your team and the fundraising that you did and everything else too. And I think the theme for me was that experience comes from judgment and, um, you had a lot of judgment, um, 
built into your experience as well. And I, I can't wait to hear you two talk a little bit about the making of and then the the life lessons that came out of that. I'll start with, Dad, do you want to just jump in there and, and ask sure. ben, ben what you're thinking? Sure. Let me just say first that, <clears throat> Debbie, it's you got it slightly different. It's mm-hmm. uh, judgment comes from experience. I did that on purpose. But experience <laughs> comes from bad judgment. That's right. <laughs> so we all want good judgment. And you know, Debbie, what I've always said about learning how to buy good horses. That's I don't know if Ben realizes this, but do you, you have any uh, suggestion for me, Ben, on how you go out there and buy good horses, just buy the good ones? Do you have any idea how you have to do that? Well, you probably had to look through a lot of bad ones. Exactly. You have to buy a lot of bad ones if you're going to try to buy a good one because it needs to hurt your pocketbook when you get it wrong. And uh, so my, my life has been led that way in competition and stuff. And and Ben, the, the Mustangs have been my professors. They've been, you know, uh, family members to me. Uh, my competition time went away in 1966 was the last year I uh, showed in competition, and I had nine world championships during the course of my career in that uh, field of of Western horse uh, competition. So watching you and your team uh, go through these things was just uh, a peak and valley, peak and valley experience all the way through, as you you would have agreed, I think. And um, yeah, what, what would you do it again? Absolutely. Let's go. Okay. <laughs> uh, do, you, do you know well, that? That, you... that was uh, that was the second time that that I've I've done the trip. Well, not the exact same trip. I did the uh, Continental Divide Trail in in 2010 and uh, with a bunch of horses. But I mean, it was amazing. Uh, yeah. I'm not going to say I loved every minute of it because that would just be a downright lie. But uh, I mean, it was. Uh, it was an incredible experience. It really was um, something I will never, ever regret doing, and I'm so thankful uh, that it's still possible to do that kind of thing. Oh, it's it's wonderful. Have you heard <clears throat> Have you heard the name Shy Boy? Um, remind me. I I, I don't know if I'm familiar. Well, with Shy, with Shy, Shy Boy. Boy Shy Boy is a Mustang, and he was gathered by the BLM and put up for adoption, as you well know that process. And um, the British Broadcasting Corporation adopted him uh, and put him on a private land of 42,000 acres uh, that had a little group of about 100 wild horses on it. Uh, They were privately owned wild horses. But he amalgamated on about a 30-day period, he amalgamated into that herd and then I went out there boldly stating that I could cause him to stay with me, that we call it join up, uh, while riding a horse. And that once I had him joined up, I could cause him to accept his first saddle and first rider in the wilderness with no fences or 20th century facilities of any kind. And that was, uh, you know, it wasn't a six month deal. Um, it actually happened in about 36 to 72 hours, depending on where you want to draw the line. Um, but yeah, I can't do that again. I'm 81 now and, uh, I just, my body wouldn't go through it again. It nearly didn't go through it, uh, in 97. So, uh, we have a lot in common here. Um, shy boy is still alive. He's 22 and he's here with us. And he even has a, a captured, uh, nephew now that we, cause we want some Mustang to be on this place as long as I'm here. And uh, I just couldn't be more impressed with the mission that you were on. And I have a lot of thoughts about that mission. So, um, you know, one of the things that I wrote down is your ability now to influence people about the value of these wonderful horses. And um, you also can influence people that they don't need to be trashed on and beat up in order to be partners with us. And I think you also would agree that you have influence in this business of saving open space. 
and not building over every acre that we own in the United States, but to leave some some natural stuff. I think you would agree with that. It, it is. Yeah, it's kind of a strange thing that people are kind of, uh, you know, looking at me for advice and even leadership in, in a way, which is something that I'm relatively new to. And it's also a tremendous responsibility because, you know, these issues that, that we address in the film and, uh, you know, they're big issues with, with big consequences and, um, a lot of them are extremely complex. Yeah. Well, it was so well done and the, and the camera work was fantastic. And you know that my life on the big screen started in 1939. I did my first stunt work as a four-year-old child and then it went on through the forties. And so I'm well aware of, uh, lighting and, and position of camera and everything. And you, you really, somebody put together a hell of a team from the videographic standpoint. Yeah, we did. We did. I was extremely, uh, I'm actually just a pretty lucky person in life, but really, really, really lucky to have met the director, Phil Baraboo at a really early stage of Unbranded. Uh -huh. And uh, we were able just to put together a, a, just an all-star team of, of production crew together. And, uh, you know, in the during the journey itself, I didn't really get to see a lot of the footage. Uh, we'd get to see bits and pieces here and there. You know, they would go back to the edit bay and put together some small pieces just so we could see that, yes, they were actually filming a movie. But the yeah. first time I, I actually got to see a rough cut, I was just blown away by how incredible of a job they did. And then you know, watching it come together to the, to the final version. I was, uh, I don't know, you know, I'll take credit for unbranded being my idea, but I never knew that it would be as good as it actually turned out. And, uh, you know, I attribute that really to, to Phil Baraboo, uh, the director who, who gathered the team together and, and spearheaded the filmmaking process. I was very fortunate for that. Well, that's great, Ben. And you know, I uh, I want to know. Have you spoken with Johnny after? I have. Yeah, yeah. We've uh, hung out quite a few times. Okay, great. Um, as an outside viewer, I was just mesmerized by um, the overwhelming influence that this could have. And I want my team to back your documentary to whatever extent we can. And I would also offer you a chance to come here any time that I'm here and have calendar for it. Um, I'd love to work with you on some ideas I have um, about Mustangs and also see the herd of wild deer that I work with here and uh, recognize the fact that I am the only human being apparently on earth to ever touch a wild deer who has never been in captivity at all. You can raise them on a bottle and they get to be very gentle, uh, deer do. But if they're raised in the wild, um, it is said by the scientists that you can't touch them. And of this group of 24 currently, it's 24 in this family group, uh, I've touched 14, rubbed on 14 of the 24. And, you know, there's a lot of commonality between you, what you did and, and the um, use of Mustangs and the deer, which are about a hundred times more sensitive than the Mustangs are. So uh, I'm still learning, Ben, and I'm here to pass on to you any information I can because you have now placed yourself in a position to be influential for the balance of your time in the handling of horses and other things, uh, the ecology and the whole business that you came through, and even the psychological aspects of getting along with one another or not you, you know um how does that work and uh, the alpha man uh who ha somebody has to run the show and you were it was your idea so you were the alpha man and um that's good uh it's not always easy to fulfill that but you have placed yourself in a position where you now have a responsibility 
and you can throw that responsibility away or you can make the most of it. And uh, I've had such an unbelievable life myself and I call myself the luckiest man in the world. And yet I've had some tremendous challenges. So um, I think there's a lot of synergy going on between the two of us. No pressure. (laughs) (laughs) Um, As far as your invitation to come out to California, I would absolutely love to and uh, see the deer herd. That would be, yes, I accept your invitation. I'm in. (laughs) Okay. Well, um, you know who I considered the star of this uh, documentary, don't you? The donkey. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Did the, you have the donkey or the donkey or Val? And my guess is Val. Uh huh. Well, that's all right. Uh, but this donkey, I loved her. It, it was a female, wasn't it? It was. Yes. Yeah, I fell in love with her because she so brilliantly fills in the blanks for me, whereby I say, "Don't tell the horse what they have to do." I say, create an environment in which the horse wants to do it. And that that de- stops the line of, of discipline or, or violence that you see typically in the traditional methods. And uh, I get laughed at and my life gets threatened and everything. And you, you will have your, your uh, people who challenge you and um, say, you know, everything you're doing is wrong. Um, but if I can help you through, I believe I've, you know, paved a path for you to travel that where you can handle those critics and call them to be your best friend because they'll keep you getting up in the morning and learning more about your discipline. Um, what do you plan to do with your life now in terms of uh, every day getting along with this thing called life? You know... I'm I'm in a very fortunate position that I have, I've had a lot of doors um, open up for me through Unbranded, and you know I believe my calling um, is is really towards the the storytelling aspect of it. I've seen what Unbranded has done, which is you know, raise a bunch of money for the Mustang Heritage Foundation, uh, raise a lot of awareness for, for wild horse adoptions. But, you know, every single day I get emails about people saying, you know, I watched your film and um, decided that I'm going to, you know, stop putting off this big adventure, this big dream that I've had, and I, I'm going to do it this summer or I'm going to start planning for it. I'm going to do it now. And, you know, for me, that, that just means so much that, uh, you know, one of the messages that, that's in the film of, you know, getting out and really living life to the fullest, uh, people are really connecting with that. Sure. And I just think that there is power in the documentary. Um, I think that it has a lot of ability to influence people and to inspire people. Uh, so I want to replicate that with, with more documentaries, uh, more films. I'm also writing quite a bit. So, you know, I'm looking forward into the future of my life um, you know, as a filmmaker, possibly as a character again, um, but just trying to tell uh, tell stories that that I believe are important and should be told and will make the world a better place. So that's kind of where I'm headed. Well, my word, how that f- folds into my mission in life and, um, uh... Now that I'm 81, I'm looking to those of you that are in their 20s and 30s um, to carry this message on. Um, I'd love to work with you a few days here and just just um, open some doors for you to think about things that I've come up with that have worked very well for me. I'd like to do that. Thank you. Yeah, good. Um, I have a lot of students out there, and there you are in Texas right now. And they just had the world greatest uh, contest there. Do, do you know about that? Which contest are you referring to? Yeah, it's called the World's Greatest Horseman Championship. And it's really just for Western because they ask you to do reining, working cow horse, cutting, roping, two different styles of roping, 
um, in the four or five days. And um, one of my students won it twice in a row. And uh, this past one just finished a couple of weeks ago. And I had two students in the top 10. One was Philip Rawls and the other one was Ron Emmons, both in the top 10. And uh, Philip was raised here on this farm and he's been second two years in a row. I got to go to work on him <laughs> to get the, get the tops one filled in. But, uh, but it's been, I think, all my world championships aside, what I do for people is the greatest um, gift to me. Um, it's so gratifying to, to help people. And you've placed yourself in a position where you're already off the launching pad and, and headed for this type of thing that I'm talking about. And uh, anything I can do to help it, I will. Well, I'll take you up on that offer. I would uh, yeah. absolutely love to come out to California and, and meet in person and uh, try to learn from you because I have no doubt that I have room for improvement with my horsemanship. Yeah, where is your gray horse right now? Uh, gray horse is in Springer, New Mexico. Um, uh -huh. I've actually kind of stopped using him. Yeah. Um, he's kicked quite a few people. Um like 10 people and then um he's done a couple a couple times he's gotten into a bind and just uh falls down hills uh oh. which is a pretty you know <laughs> not safe thing to do and no. he flipped over backwards on me and um uh landed on my leg pretty hard and so i kind of stopped using him just because i've got a lot of really good horses that I feel very comfortable around. And, and he yeah. also has a tendency to like kick people that walk behind him for no reason. Um, yeah. It's a pretty poor behavior. <laughs> yeah. Well, I can understand that. He came over well on the documentary though, I think, and seemed like uh, one of the equine leaders, you know, and um, something was said, Ben, by the elderly gentleman, really nice guy. I, I have to tell you as he came across on the screen, that was driving the truck and all that stuff. Um, and he made a statement n not to burden you with that statement. Maybe you don't agree with it at all, but that man, what was his name? His name is Val Geisler. Yeah. Val Geisler. That's right. Um, and, and in talking about the Mustangs, he said, as soon as you get comfortable, that's when you'll get hurt. When you relax, that's when they'll hurt you. And my opinion is it's exactly the opposite. It doesn't mean that you need to get in a dreadful position where the horse has a chance to hurt you. You try to stay out of that position. But relaxation, low pulse rates and low adrenaline levels, horses try to mimic that. They try to be that uh, synchrony with you. Um, and they do that because of nature teaching them that the predator generally has a higher pulse rate and they can feel it for a hundred yards. Um, so I'd like to talk to you about that and have you watch uh, Mustangs go pleasant and quiet when the handler is pleasant and quiet and, and the, and the opposite when the handler is uh, allowing the adrenaline to go up. So I believe you can relax and be comfortable. You just have to be in the right place at the same time. Right. I think that's where he was going. I, I think maybe a, a better word um, would have been uh, careless, you know. Maybe, oh, yeah. <laughs> maybe <laughs> whenever you get whenever you get careless and, you know, walk around uh, in areas that you're you're not, uh, you know, where you can get kicked or, you know, being being careless, you, you drop something on the ground or, um, you know, I, I think that's what he meant by by relax. But uh, anyways, yeah. let's, let's go ahead though. I'd, I'd love to pick your brain on it. Yeah. And, um, you know, that in front of public audiences, I've now done 11,000 horses. It's been going on for 27 years and my horse count is about 70,000 that I've worked with. And so I've had just this past, uh, July, in other words, about eight months ago, I had the sixth kick of my life. And it, that's all breeds and everything I've done. The sixth time I've been kicked, which I think is pretty low percentage-wise. <laughs> but I got kicked by a, a Mustang, 
and I got a little bit careless because he was going so well. And uh, I was relaxed, and he was too. But I did the wrong thing by trying to put a piece of leather in its keeper, and it tickled him or something, and he just jumped and kicked me right in the ribs. And uh, they said nothing was broken, but six months later, they found three broken ribs there. They hadn't opened up when they did the first x-ray. But um, you can get kicked, and, and you can get struck, as the young man that pulled the thorns out of that horse's nose will agree. Mm. Uh, you can get struck before God gets the news. And uh, I often say the front legs will kill you. The back legs will just hurt you, but uh, um, they can kill you from either end if they really get a shot at you. But it, that's that's part of the challenge that we have, isn't it? And it doesn't mean that we send amateurs in to work with Mustangs on a regular basis. But I have a course here called Gentling Your Wild Horse, and uh, I take some pretty green people uh, up the ladder, and I haven't had any injuries yet, so except that one to myself. Um, mm-hmm. But um, we're, we try to be careful, but we try to be... Uh, so I look forward to meeting you and seeing you again, uh, not on the screen, but in person. And, um, Sorry. I, I, I hear a screening coming. I think it would be fun to have you out, Ben, and um, maybe coordinate a screening of Unbranded at the same time so we can promote it in the San Inez Valley, which has so many horse representations there with so many breeds. It's like 22 different championships of breeds of horses in the San Inez Valley. So it'd be a fun place to to put Unbranded right in the middle of, and then we can we can be your host too. Yeah, that'd be terrific. Wouldn't that be um, fun? Ha- have you been here to San Inez, Ben? No, no, I haven't. It'd be my first time. Yeah, do you know about it at all? Um, I, I know where it is, and but yeah. I, no, I, I don't know a lot of, of the history. Or uh, I've never, obviously, I've never spent time there. Yeah, well, Ron Rawls uh, won two in a row of that world's greatest thing, and he was. Um, I got him when he was thirty here and he was a buckaroo on top of the mountain uh, out of Bakersfield and now he's one of the best in the world and and it just goes on and on uh, Jason Davis and Zane Davis both travel down the road with me um, and I, I have a, a young lady right at the moment that's learning mentoring under me and um, she's uh, from Wales from Cardiff in Wales and uh, the improvement that I'm seeing on her is just off the charts and she she's only been with me a short period of time. So uh, I don't know. This is my mission now because I have been thrust into a position of influence uh, on the world and South America is changing because of me like gangbusters. And uh, it's all very exciting. And you, you certainly have placed yourself to be an enormous uh, influence in this area. Mm-hmm. Well, I certainly don't want to even be associated with my horsemanship being as good as yours. <laughs> but I do appreciate the compliment and uh, I'm going to continue to work on it. And I, I do really look forward to uh, getting to know you better and, and hopefully getting to spend some time. And, um, you know, I'd like to haul out one of my horses and, and work with you, with you and you let's do it. Let's set up the screening and get it in the schedule. All right. Great. I, I'm the person you book with. Here, here we go. <laughs> it was All great. Right. Yeah, great to get you guys together. Thank you. And I, and I think this is just the start of something big. It'll be really fun to have you there. And Ben, you're going to hear all kinds of accents on the farm and everything because people come from world over to uh, just all get together and brain pool on, on these, these terrific horses. Uh, whether they're Mustangs or whether they're big old warm bloods from Germany, it doesn't really matter. They all are horses. They all speak the same language. And it sounds like you two do too. Ooh. Yeah, it's it's great synergy, and I'm yeah. all for it. Let's uh, let's get together and do something and awesome. be a good cause. Awesome. Well, thank you, Ben. Thank you, Dad, for joining us today on Horsemanship Radio. Thank well, you. Thank you for, for having, having me. me. Yeah, Absolutely. thank you for having me too, Debbie. All right. All right. Thank Talk you. at you soon. Bye bye. Okay. Nice to meet you, Monty. Take care. Um, we're really excited because Sean's Omega Fields company has done something amazing for one of our test horses. His name is Cadillac. And we felt so strongly about it that um, 
we definitely wanted to bring him on as a sponsor of Horsemanship Radio. And we wanted you to know that it came in that um, order first, is that we were so impressed with this product and with this horse's results that we wanted to have him a part of our um, our monthly shows. What is it about the Omega Fields product? Something's different. Omega Fields uh, was built around a really um, unique and proprietary technology. Flaxseed has been known for a long time to contain rich source of omega-3 fatty acids along with omega-6 and omega-9 fatty acids in in a near-perfect balance. But historically, there was a problem using it. It's high in fat, and when it was uh, milled into a feed product or a food product, it, it would go rancid very quickly. So our company had developed a proprietary technology for stabilizing this high-fat flaxseed to make it usable, uh, give it a long shelf life in a natural uh, environment. We don't use any chemicals or additives to Mm -hmm. extend the shelf life or anything like that. It's a completely natural process. That's what makes our flax really different. Um, It makes it usable. It makes it nutritious over a long period of time. We guarantee an 18-month shelf life. So Consumers can use it with confidence without it going rancid that, you know, would potentially harm the horse. So quality of manufacture, every single thing in that uh, product, Omega Horse Shine, is food grade. It's made at a food grade facility with great care of product quality. Uh, The stabilization technology makes that Omega-3 nutritional value locked in and usable for a long period of time. So proof is in the pudding, so to speak, that it, it really works. You'll see dramatic results in a fairly short period of time. Nick Roldan is often referred to as the face of American polo. Nick's philanthropic involvement as team captain in charity tournaments is widely recognized, as is his modeling career. His particular chosen charities are Kids Cancer Foundation and the Brook Animal Welfare Organization. He's dedicated to popularize the sport that he loves with a wider audience of younger players and new spectators. He's a fourth-generation professional polo player. He is at present the leading American polo player with an impressive eight-goal handicap rating with his sights set on the supreme ten-goal status. He's won on all five continents at every goal level, and he's also the youngest polo player in the world to win the prestigious U.S. Polo Open title at a ripe old age of 15. Nick is currently captain of the American polo team. Well, welcome, Nick Roldan and Monty Roberts. I've got you both on the line. I'm so impressed with both your backgrounds and and, uh, my ability to get 20 minutes out of the two of you, um, world travelers. How are you both? Well, I'm fine. Uh, I'm very well, thank you. Good. This is Monty here. Yeah. (laughs) And Nick is in Wellington, Florida. Nick, how's are you at a polo match? I'm at a polo match right now, yeah, um, and uh, everything's great here. I'm, uh, you know, it's sunny and the, and the weather's nice and we're dry, so uh, I can't complain. And Monty? I'm in Salinas, California, the town of my birth, and I've just come from the Rodeo grounds or the competition grounds where I was born, and um, they, <laughs> they have a, a golf driving range on the polo field. You'll be sad to hear, Nick, oh. but um, oh, wow. they moved. Yeah, they they moved the polo over to Pebble Beach uh, near Carmel uh, way back when I was just a child. So the polo field's been gone for a long time. But um, I'm on a nostalgic sort of trip going back over my history. Mm. Oh, great. Uh, That sounds beautiful. Yeah, it does. And it's a beautiful area, too. So all those people in Minnesota, cover your ears because they're both in beautiful areas <laughs> right now. But we are in midwinter <laughs> as we record this. But I wanted to I wanted to get people familiar with you, Nick, a little bit. And I, um, I did a bit of an introduction, but I would love to hear um, what it's like from somebody who at age 15 became the youngest player to win the U.S. polo title. Um, with a team, and uh, you are based in Wellington, Florida, so you really are the face of American polo, and um, we want to hear about that because we, we're going to talk about horses f- next, but I want to hear about what that uh, experience has been like for a young man. Yeah, so I've, uh, I, have, I grew up in Wellington. My mother and my father um, 
father from Argentina, mother from Germany. Um, moved here in, in back in 1979. And um, and my father, so I'm a third generation polo player. My father played and his grandfather played polo um, professionally. So, uh, you know, sport has been something that's always been in the family. Um, and we grew, I grew up on a farm and I've been riding since I was, you know, probably two or three years old. And uh, like like in any like in any polo family, you know, the first thing they do before you can walk is is, is strap a polo stick to your hand. So, <laughs> um, it, you know, it, it's been something that has come natural. And uh, you know, I'm always feel very blessed to be to be able to play polo. It's a, it's an amazing sport, and uh, and I'm luckily to be luckily um, was able to grow up in Wellington, which is is the mecca for polo in the United States. Um, mm-hmm. We host some of the biggest tournaments in the United States. And, um, yeah, so I, you know, I started at a young age and, um, and continued, uh, playing, um, on a, I, yeah, continued playing at a, at a, all the kids polo till I was about 14 years old, um, and was very luckily to get an opportunity to play, um, a tournament called the U.S. Open, which is our most prestigious tournament in the United States, probably yes. second or third in the world. Yes. Um, I was 15 years old, and we had we and and that was my first professional tournament, and we ended up winning it. So that was sort of the kickoff of my career, and uh, and decided that that was what I wanted to do, and you know here I am today. So yeah, yeah, with with uh, over 30 20 goal tournaments to your name, and I think it's another 10 at the 26 goal level. Uh, that's just that's an amazing repertoire. Yes. I'm humble. Yeah, it's uh, you know, <laughs> it's been uh, it's been a great career. You know, it's uh, it's been exciting. It's been um, a great experience, and you know, the, the great the the great thing about the sport of polo is uh, is you get to travel to a lot of the most beautiful places in the world, and you're, you know, you're all and and I'm doing what I love. I mean, Pat, my horse my horses has always been a passion of mine um, since I was a little kid. I've been around them since uh, forever. Um, so. Horses are my life, and uh, I feel very lucky, luckily, lucky, and um, and humbled to be able to play uh, to play polo mm. as a profession. Well, uh, I've got a couple of things to say about what he said, Debbie. One love of them that. certainly is that that U.S. Open wasn't a kickoff of his career; it was a home run on the first trip, and that that <laughs> is just un- unbelievable. And and the other thing is that. Um, don't be don't be talking to us, me at eighty, about this being a wonderful career. Um, <laughs> it's a wonderful career so far, my man, and you've got a yeah. lot of years in front of you. And uh, <laughs> my my word, my uh, watching Joe Baker and and Memo Gracida, and bless his soul, Carlos, um, uh, out here in California during my years uh, recent when they started to bring me the breakers up here and, and uh, come to my place and start to alter the way the horses are broken in Argentina uh, to become right. polo ponies. Um, it tells me that you, you have the opportunity to have a very long career. And uh, I think now that the, the horses are doing it because they love to and not because they're forced to, um, that you're going to find uh, a safer game as well. What do you think about that? Yeah, I I, I totally agree. I mean, uh, the, the the sport in itself has changed. Obviously, I mean, you have experience of of. Uh, I mean, Joel is a, is a great friend of mine and and, uh, and a legend in the sport. And uh, you know, we've worked together, and he's coached a couple of the teams, the national teams that I've played on. So uh, he's a great friend. And Memo and Carlos. Um, where the guys that um, we 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 actually we, we beat Memo and Carlos in the, in that finals in, in 1998, and then that for the rest of the year I went and played with them. So, you know, I, I sort of I tend to think that you know they were a, a huge attribute and a, and a big help to my career, um, and I look up to those guys. And obviously, those are you know close friends of yours. And obviously, it was a big shame to to lose loss and lose a dear friend Carlos. But um, but yeah, this sorry, going on to the, regarding the sport, but it's, you know, the sport has changed. The horses are becoming, you know, the horses are, I mean, they're getting better and better, the quality of horses and their, their performance is just insane. Um, and the sport of polo is growing more and more and becoming more and more competitive and, uh, and horse flesh is key. I mean, uh, you know, everyone, you know, basically the teams with the best horses are going to win. 
and uh, it's become a vital, a vital, vital, vital part of uh, of, of the winning team. So, um, well, you, you have no yeah. idea how how gratifying it is to hear those words from you. I would ask you, um, were you in Argentina uh, as a child to see the old traditional ways of breaking the polo ponies? You know, I well, I, I grew up in the United States, but we would go back to we were, we were my fam my father's from Argentina, and we would go back every year. Um, so I did get to see a, a little, I did get to see a little bit of that. Um, I wasn't born into that. Um, cause obviously things were done a little bit differently here. Um, but it was a pretty amazing to be able to experience, uh, both aspects, both in Argentina and here and in the United States. Joe brought the Gracitas and Cambiasso, uh, to me, uh, years back. And, um, when I, when I first started dealing with them, uh, Nick, uh, they didn't have any thoroughbred stallions down there because they went all native no. horses, and uh, and they said that the thoroughbred just couldn't handle it. That those thoroughbreds, when you breed them in, they all died during the breaking process. And I showed well, Monty, them what I showed. You'd be surprised. Now, eighty percent of the horses in polo are thoroughbreds. But but that's what I'm talking about. I I showed them my concept. Yep. They went nonviolent, and all of a sudden. Right. Mem- Memo and Carlos both were taking thoroughbred horses and and Cambiaso too, down there and breeding that thoroughbred blood into them and suddenly they're going faster and smoother and and doing a better job and uh, they weren't killing them. So right. Uh, well, look, you you yourself more than anyone in the world um, knows you know knows the, knows how to how to break horses and of you know of all different. Um, all different sorts. So, um, and obviously, a thoroughbred is a little bit more of a delicate horse. But um, it's definitely, you know, I I think most a lot of Argentines have, have come to find out that a good thoroughbred there isn't there is nothing better than a good thoroughbred horse. Um, yeah. And um, you know, I think there isn't an Argentine that's playing polo right now that doesn't have a thoroughbred in their string. So. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Nick, I was th- I was reading that uh, each month on social media that you highlight one of your horses, and uh, and yeah. that's a pretty pretty popular thing. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, well, you know, I, uh, I was working, um, you know, with Natasha on trying to, uh, you know, you know, the, the sport of polo is such a beautiful sport, and we're we're starting to get a lot of uh, a lot of you know publicity, and a lot of attention, but you know. We're, most importantly, the horses for me are, you know, are our form of, of living. You know, they're our workhorse, and they're, uh, you know, they're the ones that 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 are taking us on the field and 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 help us to be what we are. Eighty um, mm-hmm. percent of the sport is horses. So, and a lot of times, I don't feel like the horses get enough credit. So we decided to we decided to do every month to just pick one of my horses and just give them a little bit a little bio on. You know where it's from, its breed, what it does. You know why I like it so much. Maybe what what uh, best play ponies it's won. Um, just to kind of you know to to get the horses uh, to make the horses a little bit more famous as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love that, and well, it's even led. Yeah, isn't that cool? And it's led to rethinking some of the designs of the polo saddles, and you're working on so you're working on the horse's comfort and uh, and I suppose athleticism when you do that too. So. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, the, the sport, the sport hasn't, the sport hasn't changed in, I don't know how, in, in, you know, thirty, forty, fifty years, 50, 50 years, you know, we, yeah, no, exactly. Sorry, yeah, exactly. You know, we're still using the same sticks. It's the same methods. It's the same sort of, um, and so the the whole reason for for creating the saddle came through that. Um, you know, I was working with my chiropractor and a vet, and uh, we were just we sort of analyze the season and what, you know, what sort of injuries or, or where horses more, were more sore. And I mean, it's a very physical sport, the sport of polo. And we ask a lot from the horses. And what we were realizing that a lot of times the saddles were first of all, being placed in the wrong positions on the saddle, on the withers. Mm-hmm. And, um, and they were putting pressure in the wrong places. So we designed a saddle, um, called the, the polo gear, uh, the free shoulder elite saddle. And, um, basically it alleviates a lot of pressure on the withers. And it gives it, it gives the horse a lot more mobility, um, and it, restri- it it cuts back on um, it, it helps in recuperation of the horses, and it it makes them less sore. 
Um, it's, it, we've gotten a lot of results, and it's uh, it's because it's a great saddle, and it's comfortable, awesome. and it puts the players in the right position, and um, it's it's good. It's 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 kicking off. You know, we've been working about for about four years on this. Good. And, uh, like everything, you know, like everything yeah. that you know, like everything, it takes a little bit of time for people sure. to understand it. Uh, yeah. Which has been the toughest part is trying to educate um, a lot of guys that are usually stuck on their old ways and don't like to change things. So. But, yeah, uh, well, it's been exciting. Yeah. Does that happen? Yeah. That's my life, yeah. man. That's my life. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right? I mean, I can imagine. I can imagine. Yeah. Well, you yeah, know what? I saw some of those moves you did on in, up in the saddle, uh, Nick, and I think you're going to need a saddle that, uh, you know, stays up there. And I'm does, telling you, we do, well. we do a lot. We do, we do a lot of moving on the saddle. Um, wow. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. Well, the very the, the very nature of the sport is is demanding on on the equine anatomy, and uh, the happier we can keep our horses on the field, the better, uh, more goals we're going to score. Uh, and, yeah, and the uh, better hundred percent. Yeah, and the better bred they are, the more likely they are to love to do it. Mm-hmm. So right, uh, exactly. It, it's it's so gratifying because my life's goal is to leave the world a better place than I found it for horses and for people too. Right. And when they brought me the Gracidas and Adolfo, uh, and certainly uh, Joel's uh, inclusion there, um, it it just was an opportunity for me to go to the highest level of a discipline and make a difference. And I have to tell you, Nick, there are many disciplines where they don't want to hear from me. They want to continue the old ways, you know? Right, right. Yeah, I know. I, um, and that's, I, that's tough. Mm-hmm. I have a difficult time with, with um, you know, show jumping and dressage, um, and oftentimes they say you can say I'm wrong, but you can't say my daddy was wrong. Um, we'll do right. things the way we've done them, and and you know everything gets better or it doesn't move. And uh, the right. the right brother right. the right brothers didn't have tradition holding them back. Mm-hmm. Right, exactly, mm-hmm. correct. Well. Yeah. Yep. And, and, you know, so. I, I wanted to bring up, too, that you two run in some fair uh, highbrow circles and that um, <laughs> you might not know, but Nick has been fortunate enough to play with various members of the royal family. And um, I bet he Mon- is. Monty has a little uh, relationship there, too. Has that been yeah. some fun, Nick? <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, you know, that's it's one of the perks of being able to play polo is you get to play with some... Uh, some very honorable people, so um, it's been yeah. those have been some fun experiences. Yeah, that that Prince Harry, he's a wild man, though, isn't he? He, he he's a he's a he's a wild man, but he's uh, you know they're both great guys, and um, you know they're a lot of fun, and uh, you know and yeah, it's very impressive what they do, and you know yeah. they've uh, they've really they've really done a great job with you know with their charities and uh, and trying to keep the polo going in the family, so. Yeah. 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 That's well, you know, you know, you know, my goal is to have Harry and Wills play on a U.S. team, um, all for the benefit that would be amazing. of of my all for the benefit of my military uh, clinics that I do here in the United States for post traumatic stress people. I do them in the United States, right? Uh, in 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 uh, Australia and in England, and um, we'll get that done at some point, but, um, they're just, uh, the family has just been so good to me. I, I couldn't pay them back in three lifetimes. So I'm just trying to do everything I can to show them how much That's I appreciate great. it. And, That's great. Yeah. We'll have to yeah. have Nick on the team. I think Nick, will have to be there. Yeah. Well, he has to be I, there. And, yeah. Yeah. Good. And, and, you know, we have to have people like the Gracitas and stuff that we'd have to get the horses, right. I'd like to do the orange bowl. Uh, the Orange Bowl. I'd like to do the Rose Bowl out here first, and then um, right. and then set, set up a one a one year um, every year do a, a, a charity event for the post traumatic stress sufferers of the United States, England, and and Australia. And uh, there's a lot of Australian players, as you well know, and and um, they're they're very anxious to do it, but those kids stay busy, and I've got to keep working on getting it done. <laughs> Yeah, that's uh, great. Do you, do you know? Have you? Uh, do you know uh, around what time of the year you're wanting to do it? Have you started? Have you thought about that at all, or is that 
Philip Adobe. Nick, I, I, Nick, I, Nick, I don't even know what year I want to do it. I just want to do it <laughs> when, right, right. whenever I can. Right. Um, yeah. But, but I, I've got, I've got the agreement of Peter Uberoff here in California, who ran the most yeah, successful think. Olympics ever held, and um, he's agreed to do this if the royal family will back it. You know. So. Right. Um, I would like for Charles to come over and sit on the sidelines or something. And uh, uh, well, that would be great. I know. And I would love the queen to come over, but she doesn't travel that much anymore. And, um, right. but I think, I think one of the big airlines would probably provide her with one plane. She could stay in bed the whole time and just make a, a little wave, you know, right. but, <laughs> but, but yeah, we literally, be... but Nick, we literally could raise 10 or $15 million for, post-traumatic stress um people if we um if right. we did something like that we we would fill up the rose bowl out here and then we could go to the orange bowl or we could go to new york or wherever mm-hmm. um you that know we great. can ma- we can make a polo field out of almost anything because it doesn't have to be a regulation <laughs> field for this kind of a of game of course you know? we can make it a smaller field yeah that would be that would be amazing yeah well anything, anything i can do to help i'm uh i'm here to support you so that's yeah, awesome. and Debbie, what's the name of the young lady that came to me with the with the problem uh, with her polo horse? Oh, Isabella. Isabella. Wolf. Isabella. Do you know Isabella? Isabella. What's Wolf? her last name? Wolf. Uh huh. That's right. Wolf. Yeah, I know Isabella. Yeah, I know Isabella Wolf. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, well, say hello. Great. Say hello when you see her. She's a sweet I girl, will. and she, she came to me with a horse with some big problems with it and we got really lucky so um i oh, think wow. i think i think she'll be happy to uh hear my name spoken <laughs> yeah i hope that's she's great. doing definitely, she, she's actually she's... here in wellington so I'll, I'll i'll be sure to remind her and see her good okay. ask her how cha-cha is cha-cha was uh, the little yeah, horse that we worked with that couldn't yeah. be caught yeah and and we couldn't let you go without telling a little bit about your uh your global ambassadorship to the brook. And uh, Monty went to India in fall of 2014 on a big trip that uh, Brooke hosted. And I wonder if you might have any advice for Nick now that he's newly um, crowned as ambassador, another global ambassador for the brook. And maybe explain a little bit about that that, uh, organization. Well, well, I don't have to give Nick any advice. Nick's doing what Nick does and – that's all part of it. But I would say that if you can give, um, you know, a little bit of time each year to the work of the brook, it means they'll take you to a third world country like India or to Pakistan or or down to South America somewhere where you will see things being done with donkeys and horses and mules that is just despicable. And, and it's not that these people, you know, they don't have any money. They, they don't want to do bad things. But uh, these poor animals are, are really uh, in trouble in a lot of parts of the world. And a young guy like you can be, be a huge influence to the next generation. I'm trying to pull more females into uh, hands-on with the animals because females tend to be less uh, aggressive about their actions with the animals than the men do. And right. uh, the brook, right. the brook is, is a worthwhile cause, and I just encourage you to be the best ambassador you can. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I obviously very feel very, um, you know, very uh, blessed to 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 have been uh, be, to be able to be a part of it. Um, when the opportunity came about, you know, I, um, you know, I didn't think twice about it. Um, uh, you know, I read about a lot about what they did and and uh, what their vision and what they, you know, and uh, and it really is a great, it's something that's obviously, you know, obviously animals in general are something that's close to my heart, um, horses. You know, horses is, is my workhorse, and uh, you know I can imagine. You know, I can imagine what happens in, in third world countries. Um, and you know, I've obviously, you know, first and foremost, what I've always to tell them was that I'd love to really get to travel over to one of the to India or to Pakistan, um, and to really experience yeah. it firsthand, because um, that's yeah. that's where you really get you, you you really you get that emotional side of it, and that you really get that, yeah. that feeling um, yeah. because. It, you know, as as you well know, Monty. You know, you know Wellington. It's you know, it's it's all it's also horses, but it's a totally different. Um, <laughs> it's a different world. <laughs> it's, it's a totally different. It's a different world, right? Exactly. It's you know, a it's different a world. world. Where, you know, all the horses live like kings, and um, yeah, yeah. You know, they're all well nourished, and I mean, we don't have any issues here. 
Um, Nick, Nick, let me so, tell you that uh, when I was in India, I went to one location where I could stand on top of a hill there and I could see 8,000 horses in front of me. 8,000 wow. horses. And every horse, Nick, was, every horse was tied to the ground by his head. No trees, no buildings. Wow. Every horse was tied to the ground by his head and to the ground by one hind foot. Every horse. I can't imagine. I mean, that's, I can't, that's, a, it, that's unfathomable. Unbelievable. Um, and so, yeah. you know, the people don't want to do wrong. They do what tradition tells them to do, and uh, they do it the way Daddy did it. And no, it's exactly. Nice. And, 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 and education, you know, they're, they're just they're, they're not educated. They don't, I mean, that's the sad part is, you know, they don't know how to take yeah. care of the horses. Most of the yeah, time, they, try, they're not able to take care of the horses. Yeah, I try not to blame anybody, but just just to try to right. guide them through to a better way. Right. Well, this has been fun, um, Debbie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, yeah is, you, this is this is great. this is awesome. You two are yeah. are such such a gift to us. Thank you for sharing together today, and uh, we would love to follow up and see how your year goes uh, in 2016, Nick, and have you two chat it up and see. Uh, See where I'd, we can I'd take, love to do that, and I'd follow. love to uh, hopefully see you guys in, the, in, in person, uh, hopefully one okay. day. If you're Thanks. ever over on the East Coast, please uh, please let us know. And, um, and um, you know, it's obviously it's, it's been an honor to speak to you, Monty. And, um, it's an and, honor uh, to speak for, with you. Yeah. And best of luck, and welcome to the world of uh, making the world better for horses. That's nice. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Whisper the language of the herd. Listen, you don't have to say a word. It's time for Jamie Jennings to fetch an email from Monty Roberts' inbox and share a morsel of Monty's wisdom in a little segment we like to call Ask Monty. Leave this world a better place and learn the magic in the language of the I attended a four-day clinic at Flags Up Farms to become familiar with your techniques and have been starting all of our babies successfully now for six years. Recently, we have been breeding Irish sport horses in addition to our thoroughbreds, and I've discovered that the ISH Irish sport horse does not have a particularly strong flight instinct. The problem that I now encounter is that All of the babies will exhibit all four signals within a couple of laps around the pen, and usually without even cantering. I can startle them into moving away initially, but it can be difficult to keep them moving without chasing them, which makes them leery of join-up. If I don't chase them, they will join up and follow, but not well because they've exhausted the flight instinct. I've experimented with moving on to saddle, rider, etc. more quickly, but have found that mentally they are not really ready for this either. I believe this is due to the fact that I have a less than successful join-up. Your method has worked really well, and we have produced many lovely riding horses as a result, so we hope that we can transfer this process to our ISH babies with as much success. Monty's Answers I am pleased to hear that these methods are working for you and especially that you are producing champions. I suppose it's possible that you are worrying about things of lesser importance than you need to. I work with many ISH on my tours and I find them to be quite normal within the realm of Equus. If I have a horse that is exhibiting lower flight tendencies than I am comfortable with, I will often use a plastic shopping bag on a long bamboo cane to increase their flight response. When I feel I have what I want, I simply toss it out over the fence and proceed without the bag. You might try this, but it sounds like you are doing well as it is. It is commendable that you're working to improve your relationship with your horses and understand their nature better. I am certain that as you add numbers to your experience bank, you will look back at this question with a chuckle. The problem you cite is certainly not one of deep concern, but I find it interesting that you place importance on the breed you're working with. Certainly, there are differences as we journey through the many breeds the equine world has to offer. However, it is my opinion that the similarities far outweigh the differences. I find the ISH to be a wonderful breed. They are filled with athletic ability and generosity as well. Because of their heterozygous background, they are blessed with what the geneticists would call hybrid vigor. 
Without going into a full genetics lesson, let me briefly explain to you that thoroughbreds, Arabs, and other breeds that have existed in a pure form for prolonged periods of time, centuries, have a more consistent gene pool and are termed trending towards homozygous. Geneticists agree that pure forms of any particular breed possess less hybrid vigor than those of a more recent origin, which are more tending towards heterozygous. The warm bloods of the world, including the Irish sport horse, are the result of recent outcrosses to the mix of bloodlines of the cooler draft breeds with those of established thoroughbreds. These horses tend to have a more vigorous physiology. They will generally have healthier feet and stronger bones than the older breeds. They also tend to have more laid-back attitudes. Physiologically as well as physically, they are generally less fragile than their purebred cousins. The ISH Irish Sport Horse is extremely intelligent and highly trainable, and if we get it right with these horses, they will become exceptionally gentle and often great mounts for the children of the horse world. I encourage you to continue your work with your ISH and believe that you will ultimately return to me with reports of great successes. For more of these insights into good horsemanship, go to www.montyroberts.com and click on the orange banner that says Get free horse tips. Hi, I'm Monty Roberts, and I'm dedicated to training horses without pain. You can learn to do it, too, on my Equus Online University. Western, English, the beginner, or the advanced rider, it doesn't matter. You can connect with other students online, too, on our forum, and there's a new lesson every week. It's a lifetime of learning for you on my Equus Online University at MontyRoberts.com. What in the wide, wide world of sports is going on here? Where in the world is Monty Roberts? Monty is looking forward to meeting some new friends, two-legged and four-legged, in England, March 5th, 11th, and 19th. And then he pops over to Denmark on April 9th, Then he heads to Germany, April 24, April 23, April 30th, and then he goes to Austria, May 5th, and then May 7th, and then he goes to South Africa. If he hasn't gone far enough, he goes all the way to South Africa on May 28 and 29. He'll be in Johannesburg, and then on June 4 and 5, those are two different events on on the weekends there, he'll be in Cape Town, and I'm going to join him there. It's too good a trip to pass up. And then in July, he... uh, 17th through the 21st, he has a special training with a translation in Portuguese. That's for our our Brazilian and Portuguese friends. And on August 1st through 5th, he has a Monty special training at Flag is Up Farms in California. And it's in English. Yay. And then August 22 through September 2nd is the Gentling Wild Horses courses that Ben and Monty talked about in the episode. And that's the one that Jamie Jennings attended last summer. And uh, we'll probably be seeing some more wild Mustangs in that offing as well. Woohoo! All about the yeah. Mustangs. It is. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> For details about today's show, no, you don't have to remember them all. You can go to horsemanshipradio.com where we'll have links and we'll have some pictures and more information about our guests. And we love to hear from you. We love feedback. Please follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Monty Roberts and Monty Roberts tweets. That's right. He is on Twitter at twitter.com slash Monty underscore Roberts. And many thanks to our sponsors because they make this show possible. That would be IFA, Omega Fields, and Monty Roberts University. Yes, and be sure to visit all the other great shows, too, on the Horse Radio Network at www.horseradionetwork.com. Until next time, have many happy horse hours. (laughs) 